doing a good job at that review, and uh, it may happen this year, at least the Bush administration would like to submit what we call the 123 agreement, the Peaceful Nuclear Cooperation Agreement with India to Congress uh, this year. And you're going to have to take a look at this because it's a, a special agreement. It cannot enter into force without a joint resolution of approval by Congress. This means both houses, you are going to have to do several things. The first is you're going to have to look at whether the draft document, not draft, the signed document, which was signed last summer, the 123 agreement, meets the relevant Atomic Energy Act requirements. You will also, that, that you would do normally for any 123 agreement, but now you're also going to have to look at how it meets, whether it meets the High Act requirements. Um, the last thing we're gonna, I'm going to just touch on, and I think Daryl is going to spend a little more time, is you have to consider the question of what other nuclear suppliers will be doing in the nuclear suppliers group. And the reason why this is particularly important is because the nuclear suppliers group is going to act before any of you do, which means that if the nuclear suppliers group takes a decision, making an exception for India to the full scope safeguards, that is comprehensive inspections requirement um, <clears throat> that they adopted several years ago. Um, if they do take that decision, then India will be allowed to trade with countries like France and Russia, who don't have as strict requirements as we do on nuclear cooperation. And it's a big question right now whether France and Russia will engage in the kinds of activities that the U.S. government would like to see restricted, in particular some kinds of sensitive nuclear technology cooperation and enrichment and processing. Um, so the bottom line is that if the nuclear suppliers group gives a clean, what we call a clean exception, no conditions, no restrictions, um, there are two things, in, in, or in addition to the sensitive enrichment and reprocessing cooperation, um, nuclear cooperation with other states could continue even if India tests a nuclear weapon. And this is, I can't stress strongly enough, contradicts not only the Atomic Energy Act, but the Hyde Act, and the Hyde Act is quite explicit in this. Okay, so some of the questions, I'm now on the fourth slide right here. Congress taking a decision. Does the 123 agreement, the agreement that was signed last summer, meet the requirements of the Atomic Energy Act and the Hyde Act? And the first question is, does it reflect a requirement to halt exports if India tests a nuclear weapon? And the answer is no. Does it require India to be involved in the development of a proliferation resistant fuel cycle for these sensitive nuclear transfers to occur? And by sensitive nuclear transfers, I mean, once again, uranium enrichment, plutonium reprocessing, exactly the kind of thing that we are trying to stop Iran from doing, and other countries that we are concerned about. Does it make that requirement? The answer is no. Does it specify that a nuclear test by India gives the U.S. the right to ask for all its stuff back. You know, in other words, whatever we send them under this agreement, if India tests a weapon, uh, does it have to, or do, can the U.S. ask for everything back, uh, or some portion thereof? And the answer is no. If you go to this larger piece of paper here, there are more specifics. Um, on the nuclear test, which is the first row, The Atomic Energy Act and the Hyde Act, well, mostly the Atomic Energy Act, says the U.S. must halt all U.S. nuclear exports if India resumes nuclear testing. The administration will tell you, well, we're not clear, it's, you know, it's a presidential sanction. The answer is six, there must be a 60-day halt in exports. And then the president, the president, if he seeks to waive this, uh, which is under Section 129 of the Atomic Energy Act, St exports still have to halt for 60 days, so that's not, uh, not an issue. The agreement that was negotiated last summer, it allows for termination for any reason after one year's notice. The agreement itself doesn't mention nuclear testing at all. Now, 
Why is this a problem? Legally speaking, it doesn't have to mention nuclear testing because for, for various reasons, and if you're interested, we can talk about it in the Q&A section. But virtually all of our 123 agreements mention nuclear testing. They say that if country X, usually it's a non-nuclear weapon state, uh, tests a nuclear device, the agreement will be terminated. So you have to ask the question, why doesn't this agreement say that? Um, the State Department, if you keep going across the road, the State Department has said, well, gee, yeah, if they test, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll halt cooperation. That's not what the Indians are saying. The Indians are saying, this agreement doesn't in any way affect India's right to undertake future nuclear tests if necessary. So there's a gap there between what is in the agreement, between what the law requires, what's in the agreement, what the administration is saying, and what the Indians are saying. So this really deserves pretty close attention. I'm not going to go into the, the second point about the development of a proliferation resistant fuel cycle, just that um, this kind of cooperation would require an amendment to the agreement. And the administration says that, well, gee, you know, in, in off the record briefings, they say, well, it's not going to happen. You know, it's, and it's a long way down the road. And we're, you know, we're not going to do this. Moreover, they told Congress nine different times that they would not engage in enrichment and reprocessing cooperation. But nonetheless, it is in the agreement that says, you know, we can do this if there is an amendment to the agreement. It is not clear, because this agreement is unique. There is no precedent. It is not clear whether Congress, what kind of congressional approval would be required for that amendment. So I just bring that to your attention. Um, I'm going to talk on the, the last two slides. I'm kind of skipping over some things, but feel free to ask questions. Um, does the 123 agreement, so first we have, does it actually meet the legal requirements? And there are three areas I believe that it does not. Does it undermine the requirements of the Hyde Act? And here, I, I think the answer has to be yes, it does undermine the requirements of the Hyde Act. Are those enough for you to reject the, the agreement? I don't know, but it does several things. It um, in particular with relation to the nuclear testing, it provides four different kinds of fuel assurances for India, including that the U.S. will convene a group of friendly suppliers to restore fuel supply to India in the event of a cutoff. Does this sound like the Hyde Act provision which says, the Hyde Act provisions, there's more than once, one, the U.S. shall work with other NSG, I'm sorry, the U.S. shall not seek to facilitate or encourage the continuation of nuclear exports to India if nuclear transfers are suspended or terminated under U.S. law. In other words, if the U.S. has to cut off, you wrote in the Hyde Act that you shouldn't go and encourage or facilitate other countries supplying India with nuclear exports. Um, these are just a sampling. It's a very complex issue uh, or set of issues, but these are a sample of the divergences between what is in this nuclear cooperation agreement as signed and what was required, not only by the Italian Energy Act, but also by the Hyde Act. 